Good morning, UCC and guests and visitors and lurkers alike. Welcome to another uh, morning of uh, UCC. Hey, I hope everyone's doing okay. This new lockdown, it just sucks. It honestly, it just does. I hope you're doing well. We're going to talk a little bit more about mental health at the end. I just want to share some things about that. But before we do that, let's just continue on our series on First John. Now, we've been in First John for a little bit of a while now. John is the type of writer that is like a steak dinner every time. And for you vegetarian and vegans, I apologize. But it's just this idea that every portion of scripture in his letter, it's just, it's just so deep. And so it's taken us longer to kind of go through this because we don't want to skip over too much. Because again, there's so much content here. And so we want to make sure that we're pausing to make sure, to just to uh, appreciate the message that John is giving us. So let's just recap what we talked about last week. Last week, we looked at 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. And remember, we were looking at this idea of the different types of love. Right, So John is going to go into this idea of love even deeper. This morning, he's going to kind of shift a little bit, but next week, you'll see he's going to come back to it. Right, So we look at this idea of dead love, confirmed love, and bold love. And again, I love this passage of scripture from 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Now, what I love about that is that, like, again, oftentimes we all come to this point where we feel we feel unlovable, right? We feel so far from God because of our sin, our addictions, our behaviors, uh, things that have done to us, things we've done in the past. And again, the enemy knows this, right? The enemy knows this. He uses these things like a lever to move us away from God. And again, just John's reminder that God is greater than our emotional states. He's greater than what we feel. And I said last week that 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 was the key to understanding this section. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. See, John is going to continually connect our behavior with what we believe. And it's very much a, a kind of a test on a consistent basis to see if we actually are aligned in each part, right? Our behavior will justify or invalidate our beliefs. This is really important, right? Because if we don't actually live the truth that we proclaim, well, the fact is, A, within our, our circle of believers, we can recognize that. But also, the other part, too, is that the world can also recognize that as well. And that's the unfortunate part. Remember I told you last week I had this aha moment, right? So what John is really kind of doing, and he's been doing this consistently, is he's been asking us to, uh, to check our maturity levels, right? This is not something we talk about in the church. And one of the reasons we don't talk about it, especially within the Western church, is because the results are very disheartening. So what we have to ask ourselves is how mature are we in our Christianity? Now, remember, your age is not your spiritual maturity. You could be a 60-year-old, attended church your entire life, and still be an infant. You could be a 20 or 30-year-old, and you could be devoted uh, to scripture, your daily disciplines of prayer, meditation, fasting, and you could be spiritually more mature than the 60-year-old. So we have to remember, age is not spiritual maturity. But what John has been doing consistently is he's been asking us to see where we are, right? Are we at the beginning of our Christianity? Remember, John loves this idea of belief, right? So that's the beginning for John in regards to the, 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 the uh, tipping point for being a Christ follower. And then he just kind of goes through and he kind of lists it. But remember, mature Christianity for John is loving our enemies, right? When we become a Christ follower, that loving our enemies is difficult, right? But again, there's this progression, right? Remember, it's transformation. And again, we're going to look at that this morning, right? John consistently asks, are we being transformed, right? Stagnation is spiritual death to John, to Jesus, and again, to Christianity. Um, we wrapped up with this passage of scripture from John chapter 14, verse 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And remember this, this quote, again, this is, this is tattoo worthy, right? It's not the size of the sin, but the depth of the relationship. And this is what John consistently keeps coming back to you, right? Remember, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to purify us and forgive us from all unrighteousness, right? So what John is saying here is that we get, we get hung up on the size of the sin, 
right? But John's saying, listen, you're looking at the wrong metric. It's not how often you sin. It's not types of sin. It's not even what kind of sin. It's the depth of your relationship with your creator. That's what John wants to know. So that's what we looked at last week. And just to remind, just a reminder for those of you who, who join in sporadically, or perhaps you're joining us for the first time this morning, on our UCC Wadley website, all our previous teachings are there in audio and video format. Uh, so you can always go back and kind of catch up if you want. So let's kind of j- jump in this morning, because John is going to shift again, as he is prone to do. And he's going to not talk about behavior so much, but he's going to ask a question about belief. So came across this great article, uh, and I love the title of it, right? So, Good Ways to Develop Bad Theology. So what is interesting is theology is this concept that we have within the Western church that seems to have been um, set aside for pastors or academics, but the fact is that's actually incorrect. And let me just share a little bit of the article first before I jump in there, right? Um, Clayton Craby says this, He gives different ways of that. So one of the ways he says is ignore difficult Bible passages. The best way to develop bad theology is to skip over passages that are confusing or challenge your understanding. What's interesting about um, the Bible, and we've talked about this at UCC, is we are not trying to elevate one portion of the Bible over another. Instead, what we are trying to do is harmonize the entirety of the message of the Bible. And this is actually really important because, you know, you can look in the Old Testament, and you can see a passage or, or, or an account and go, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. And you can kind of ignore it or you can overlook it. Uh, I was having a conversation with my farmer, Jim, uh, and I mentioned that kind of the joke I've said to you, you've heard it, but he laughed because he had never heard it. I said, we read the Bible, you know, we used to read the Bible with a highlighter, right? We used to highlight passages of scriptures that we like. Now we read the Bible with a Sharpie. We, we, we take out passages of scriptures we don't like. He chuckled, you've heard the joke, but you get the idea, right? So one of the things that Clayton says is that one way to have bad theology is to ignore a difficult Bible passage. Another way is only read authors that agree with you. Avoid reading or listening to those who do not fully subscribe to your exact theological viewpoint, and you'll be unlikely to grow beyond your current level of spiritual maturity. This is really important. I try as a pastor to, whether uh, by podcast or by books or by articles, I read people I absolutely disagree with. And the reason I do so is not that I want to expose myself to all the kind of craziness, but on the one hand, I also want to make sure that I haven't missed something. Right? I just want to make sure that I haven't kind of um, missed a perspective or perhaps even like a, a, a scriptural point. But it's also to kind of strengthen and make sure what I do believe is accurate or, or, or correct. So ignoring um, uh, reading authors, and again, that comes to this idea of confirmation bias. Two more. He says, another way we can have bad theology is to compromise to avoid confrontation. Another theological error may, uh, many make is to abandon essential truth just to avoid confrontation with others. What we're seeing right now within Western Christianity is Western Christianity has come to this crossroads. And the crossroads is um, we are finally realizing as a church is that we have been moved from the center of culture, which we occupied back in the 1950s, to now in 2021, we are actually on the fringe of culture. We have been moved from the center to the very outskirts of the, uh, of the culture. And when you're on the outskirts, you have to realize that what we are saying, what we are believing, is now becoming offensive to the center. And so what happens is, is you can go, well, well, wait, maybe we didn't really mean that, or perhaps we just wanted to have this, right? So it's this idea of saying, you know what, we can compromise so that more people can like us we just want to be want to be liked, right? And and what can happen with that is we become inauthentic to what the Bible tells us is actually true, right? And so there is this conforming or or there is this this way of compromising that can actually be hurtful to creating a kind of a bad theology. And the last way it says this: only read books about the Bible and not the Bible itself. We can easily fall into the habit of reading about the Bible and failing to spend time reading the Bible itself. Doing so leaves us theologically imbalanced, especially if we commit the previous error of avoiding those we disagree with. You know, it's funny, as a pastor, if I'm having a conversation with somebody about theology or, or what the Bible believes, within five minutes of talking to them, I can usually tell whether they've been, they're, if they're referencing a person 
or a church or a movement as opposed to the Bible. Right? And this is actually kind of important. So what can happen is we can look to a person as opposed to the actual text itself, and that can actually you know, be kind of crazy. Um, I'm going to add a fifth one, if that's okay, and even if it's not, what are you going to do, right? So the fifth one, I would say, is this. Listen to celebrities, right? Celebrities and celebrity Christians, pastors, authors, and musicians have been given an undue place of prominence in culture, and unfortunately, those who follow them are more likely to adopt their beliefs unquestionably. This is actually a huge one, right? We live in celebrity culture, and not just within um, the, uh, the non-Christian world. In Christianity, we have celebrity pastors, we have celebrity musicians, and again, just because you use the label Christian doesn't mean you're actually aligning yourselves with Christian beliefs. And so what can happen is, as we adopt these beliefs and these behaviors, just because we like the music, we like how they dress or how cool they are, how many followers they have, you know, and, and again, whatever, whatever the metric might be. And so listening to celebrities is actually kind of, it's, it's this point where you realize that um, it's probably not healthy in regards to kind of refining what we believe and how we are with that. So this morning, John is going to ask us for that. Let me just give you a reminder about one of the phrases that John will use in their teaching this morning, right? So remember, John is going to use Antichrist. And he's used it before, and I unpacked it for you back then. But I also want to remind you once again, Antichrist to John is anti-Christian. John uses this term to group together beliefs and behaviors that are opposite to a biblical worldview, right? So when we hear the word or the term antichrist, we can in our minds go to an individual and that can be correct in other contexts. Now remember, it's only in John's letter that he actually uses the term antichrist. Nobody else uses it in the New Testament. But remember, John's, not, um, John's book isn't a prophetic book about the future. It is about the current state of the church as John is writing this. John will write another book called Revelation that will talk about future and, and all that, but this one isn't that. So antichrist isn't an individual. It's not a movement. It's not, it's not a movie that you're going to watch. It's actually this anything that would be anti-Christian. Now, when it comes to this idea of theology, one thing you have to remember is every Christian is a theologian. R.C. Sproul says this, every Christian is a theologian. The issue for Christians is not whether we are going to be theologians, but whether we're going to be good theologians or bad ones. And I, again, I actually agree with this in, in, in a great deal sense. Like theology, whatever theology is, it's simply the pursuit of understanding God. And I want you to know something. Atheist to charismatic. I'm trying to think of the extremes, right? What are the two extremes of, of, of people in the world, right? Atheists who believe that there is no God. Well, that is a, and I know they'll, and I've, I've had a conversation with an atheist. He, he, he did not like this term, but I said that is a theological assertion, right? Because again, his, his argument to me is you have no proof of God. And I said, well, actually, that's not true. However, I understand where you're coming from, but neither do you. And so your dismissal of, of a theological concept is, is a theological statement, right? But to the charismatics, and again, that's, that's, that's my tribe. That's my background, right? So from atheist to charismatics, you're all theologians, because what we are really trying to do, what humanity is simply trying to do, is understand our, our, our place in the world. Our, and, and, that, and that place within the world, it needs a narrative. One of the things we're seeing right now within the news and within media and America, America ruins everything. I just, you know, I'm not big in America, so that's, you know, I'm okay with saying that. But America ruins everything because America, uh, Americans will dominate the narrative in regards to a whole variety of topics, right? And again, these topics, I would say, are theological because what they're trying to do is understand their place in the world. So we are all theologians. Um, Ray Stedman, on his commentary on this chapter, he says this, It is significant that this warning comes in the midst of John's discourse about love, because false spirits tend to make a great deal of the subject of love. Every cult, every deviant group, every false movement makes its appeal in the name of love. As we unpack this passage of scripture, what you're going to see is 
this is kind of this is sandwiched between love, right? So we saw last week how the different kinds of love, and next week John is going to have his very famous um, uh, verse: "God is love," right? But in the midst of it, John is going to say, "Okay, let's make sure we are testing our beliefs, right?" And what Ray Sedman is saying here is that you know this idea of love has been used to kind of cover so many things that actually don't actually apply to God, right? So if God is loving, then of course he's going to love this behavior, this decision, this way of looking. And again, that is a gross misrepresentation of the biblical story of what God wants to unpack for us. And so what Ray Sedman is saying is actually kind of important. And, and he's saying here that, you know, John is going to make sure that our love isn't so emotional that it doesn't become theological, that it doesn't become practical, and that it doesn't actually be displaced from the story of the Bible. John has been talking about behaviors for a while, but now he will shift to remind us that we are what we believe. So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the passage of Scripture. We're going to look at 1 John chapter uh, 4, verses 1 to 6, and we're going to break it down into three parts. John gives us the reason for discernment, the basis for discernment, and the evidence for discernment. So let's take a look at the verse 1. Now, just to let you know here, I just want to let you know ahead of time, we're going to spend a lot of time on this one. Like, like a lot of time. We're just going to touch on this one and we're going to wrap up with this one. Like verse one is going to take most of our time because you have to understand what John is saying here and you have to see the implications of that. And I'm going to show you a current day application of it today. So what does John say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1? Open your Bibles, get your digital devices out or on the online church, click on your tab and you can bring it up there. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says this. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Now, again, John is going to shift here uh, and, and kind of look at, make us, force us to examine our beliefs. Now, just a quick note here, that one of the things I kind of realized here is when John says, do not believe, remember, John loves the word belief, right? John's gospel uses the word believe and belief far greater than Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined, right? So he is all about believing, but he's also about this idea of make sure you believe what you believe is true, right? So the word belief here is pistil from pistis. It's a Greek term, relax, is in the form of a present imperative with a negative, which is John's charge. I know, it's complicated. But simply speaking, there's two parts to this, right? There's two tensions to the word that John uses here. The first one is to not to begin to accept. In other words, when you hear something wrong, reject it. But the second part, and I think this is really important, is ceasing an action. In other words, if you have been listening to someone or reading something and you realize, oh, that's actually wrong. Well, stop at that point as well, too. The implication is that John acknowledges the need to constantly reassess what we are believing. He's being gracious in this, right? So, like, the reality is, is that we can be enamored, we can be taken up, we can oh, subtly be open to something that maybe perhaps isn't as the Bible would have. Now, there's a voice in my head relax. There's many voices in my head. I don't always speak them out loud, but the part of my head, my voice in my head is, is a conversation I had with somebody a number of, a couple of years back when they said, well, what makes it say that your, Bible, your interpretation of the Bible is better than mine? Or what makes your uh, interpretation of this passage of scripture or, or this, this act or this behavior more accurate than mine? And you know what? That's actually a fair statement, right? That's actually a fair statement. My response was, to the individual was, is your interpretation is inconsistent to the old, the entire Bible. What, what they were doing was they were taking a certain passage of scripture, a certain behavior, and they were saying that all these other passages of scripture that said this behavior or passage was negative, they are discounting those and elevating that. And that's where you have the inconsistency. So John is saying here, you know, you can hear something and you get to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not sure that's actually accurate. And he's saying, perhaps you've been entertaining. And you get to go, okay, I've heard you out, but now I'm going to say, I'm going to stop you right there. Because what you're saying, what you're trying to propagate about who God is and the Bible, 
is actually inaccurate. So the first one there is this idea of saying, okay, let's make sure that what we are believing is accurate. Now, the question that arises, of course, is how do you test the spirits? Right? That's, that's the, John's major claim here, right? Remember, John is writing in, in 90 AD to the second and third generation of Christians, right? And so within this time period, there are people who have risen up within the church who are teaching something that's very different than what the Bible teaches, and which is actually kind of comforting to me because, you know, you know, a couple thousand years later, well, we're still dealing with that as well, too. So how do you test the spirits? John Stott, the famous, famous theologian, again, deep thinker, somebody I, I greatly admire, says this, the biblical balance, avoiding on the one hand the extreme superstition, which believes everything, and on the other, the extreme suspicion, which believes nothing. Right, and I think he's absolutely correct. Right, so on the one hand, the charismatics, perhaps, who believe everything, again going to the extremes I said before, or the atheist, on the other hand, that believes nothing. Right, John Stott would say that these two polarities, you know, don't 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 go towards extremes. So I'm going to give you four rules for discernment. Again, you could add more, but just for this morning, I'm going to give you the first one. So the first rule is. Um, is the belief or behavior found in the Bible? One of the things that's really important of being a Christ follower, as soon as you say that you're a Christ follower or you, that you're a Christian, the implication is that Christianity then is based upon the Bible. Now, the reason it's based upon the Bible is because that is our only way of verifying or authenticating our beliefs because we actually have a written code or written uh, story that these values, these behaviors are either uh, affirmed or negated, right? So the first thing we have to always ask is that, is it found in the Bible? Now, just remember, just because it's found in the Bible in regards to sometimes behaviors, it's not saying these are good behaviors. There's a passage of script, well, there's many passages of scripture where people behave badly and someone says, well, look at that. And you have to go, okay, whoa, Please read the entire passage because what God is saying here is don't do this, right? So is it found in the Bible? The other one, which that actually might surprise you a little bit, is is it found in more than one place in the Bible? See, oftentimes there are people whose sole job is to find really obscure passages of Scripture and then take that passage of Scripture and say, see, look. And my response is, well, I see it, yes, and I'm not going to deny it, it's, it's absolutely there, but is that also, is it everywhere? Right, so for example, one of the more common ones that I used to hear is that, you know, um, the Bible is bloodthirsty, God is bloodthirsty, God is violent, right? I used to hear that all the time, and I still do to some, from some people, but again, my response is, yes, remember, the Bible is an ancient document set in the Middle East amongst uh, ancient people. We cannot transpose our Western values, our Western aesthetics to this groups of people. And also realizing as well, too, that this times of violence, which are in the Old Testament, is not seen in the New Testament in the fulfillment of Jesus, right? So again, you can't say, oh, the Bible teaches us violence because that's actually not true. It, what it does is it documents times of violence, which is absolutely accurate to an ancient people, but shows us that this is not the way. The third one I would say to you is, does the belief or behavior find its place in Jesus? So for us as Christ followers, we look at Jesus and we say, Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of our beliefs and behaviors as Christ followers, right? Jesus is the visible form of God. So how he acts and how he behaves is of great importance to us because that's going to help us to know how to act and behave as well. Now remember, Jesus is living in a time when the Roman Empire is the predominant um, force in the world. Well, I would say to you that we are living in the time when the Roman Empire is the dominant uh, force in the world. And by Roman, I mean Western, I mean uh, way of, uh, just the, the, the fragmentation of beliefs, right? So as Jesus is living and behaving, we can look at it and going, oh, I see it there. And this is kind of a new one that I've really kind of been thinking about, but I just want to give it to you as well, too. How does this belief and behavior fit into the Jewish context? You guys know if you joined us in for Easter that I am a huge fan of understanding the Bible through a Jewish filter. 
Remember, however you understand the Bible, remember, it wasn't written to you. It wasn't written to me. In other words, it wasn't written to Gentiles. It was written to Jewish people first. So before we Westerners can look at the Bible and say this is what it means and what it doesn't mean, the first filter that we have to drop into place is what did it mean to Jewish people? Right? Remember we looked at Palm Sunday? Right? And I showed you the five layers of Palm Sunday. And again, I was as astounded as some of you responded were as well, too, in regards to how much was going on. But remember, the gospel writes, the gospel writers write these things, and they don't explain themselves because the people reading it understand. But we, 2,000 years later, are like, I have no idea. Right? So whatever the belief and behavior is, what's the Jewish context? You know, I was talking to somebody. And they were talking about sexuality within the church. And again, it's a controversial topic. Everybody's talking about it. And again, not here to tell you what to believe or not to believe. But what I did say to the individual was, is that when you look at the New Testament church, right? Again, the New Testament church is predominantly a Gentile church. Well, that Gentile church lived out a sexuality that was very Jewish, Right? They lived out a Jewish way of understanding covenantal relationship, which again, they could have absolutely you know, separated themselves from and gone their own direction. But according to the first 300 years, and we have a great deal of historical records, they lived like the Jewish people did. So the question I always ask myself is, does whatever the belief and behavior, does it fit into the Jewish context? See, there's a, these are just some rules of, of what it looks like to have kind of, how do we test the spirits? How do we test what we believe? Let me go on. To see the spirit they have comes from God. Now, what's interesting here is what we have to understand as Christians is that when we hear somebody who tells us something that's very different than the Bible, we just assume sometimes that the person is just mis misinformed or wrong. Well, John actually gives us more of a darker motivation. He actually says to us that the enemy plants people within the church to divide and to tear down the church. But see, as Christians, we just assume if you call yourself a Christian, you must be a Christian and we must have commonality of belief. Well, John actually doesn't believe that. And, and nor should we. And for those who have been our screw tape letters, small group, we are kind of getting this glimpse of the demonic realm and what the enemy will do. Just think about it for a moment. If you wanted to tear down an organization, well, you could do a frontal assault, which the enemy tried to do in the Middle Ages, didn't work. What's a better way to tear it down? Infiltrate it. So weird theology and watch it implode. And honestly, <laughs> that's kind of what we're seeing today, right? The church is finding itself in this really weird position that pastors have not emphasized beliefs enough theology enough so that we are now stuck with a group of people who call themselves Christians who actually don't believe what the Bible would say is true. It's one of the reasons why at UCC we do this thing, we did this thing called Theology Pub. And the reason we did it was just simply to have this conversation that went a little bit deeper, just to say, okay, here are the underpinnings of why we believe what we believe, right? Which is actually, I think, kind of important. William Barclay says this, and I think this is kind of important. He says, behind this warning is a situation of which we in the modern church know little or nothing. In the early church, there was a surging life of the spirit which brought its own perils. There were so many in such diverse spiritual manifestations that some kind of test was necessary. Let us try to think ourselves, let us try to think ourselves back into that electric atmosphere. And just to let you know, as a, as, as a former Pentecostal, or maybe a recovering Pentecostal, there's different ways you can apply that. I remember as, as a teenager being in services where stuff was going on, and I wasn't sure if what was going on was of God or, or, or whatnot. And the thing was, it's not, like again, it's not for me to judge, of course not, but no one ever explained to me what was actually taking place was in the Bible. Right? A number of years ago, there was a revival that took place in Toronto. And when I was in, in Bible college, everybody was talking about it. Right? And it was actually very divisive amongst Pentecostals and Charismatics. And so what took place was, everyone was kind of saying, yes, this is the best thing ever. 
or others were saying, no, this is the worst thing ever. And I was in the middle going, I, I actually don't know. Right? I, I just don't know. I don't want to make a definitive statement, but then again, I don't want to be completely accepting. That's where you know, um, John Stott you know, echoes in my mind. So what's interesting is, is that life of the Spirit, we all say we want it, but we also have to ask ourselves, well, what does that actually look like? Um, there's an uh, interesting article. There's an interesting kind of phenomenon going on right now about prophecy in the church. This is where it's going to get uncomfortable. So this great article written by Ruth Graham says this, Christian prophets are on the rise. What happens when they're wrong? This was in the New York Times, by the way, so I don't know if that discounts it in your mind or not, but I think she makes some great points here. Here's what she says. Um, in the article, it says this, In my lifetime, 49 years as a follower of Jesus, I've never seen this level of interest in prophecy, said Michael Brown, an evangelical radio host and commentator who believes in prophecy but has called for greater accountability when prophecies prove false. And it's unfortunate because it's an embarrassment to the movement. This past year has been riddled with prophecies that did not pan out. Now, you guys know, I don't get political because I don't believe any political party represents God. You know that, right? However, remember I said Americans ruin everything? Back in January, right, there are, were all these Christian leaders, some prominent, some, how do I say this in a gentle way? Not so promising. Uh, okay, they're just, they're just stinking crazy, okay? And they were all predicting political outcomes. Right now, understand something. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't an individual who said, "Oh, like if you see my social media posts, I post pictures of my dog." Okay, that's that's as much as I get involved because again, social media is where trolls live, not where authentic conversations usually happens. Now, what was interesting about this though is that many people made uh, things, and I was actually going to have an article where I name names. I I, I replace that with this one because I think this is a little bit more important, right? What we have seen over the last year is prophecy within the church has just just elevated itself. And there's so many individuals who have come forward and have made bold claims, right? Bold claims. And these claims have been absolutely wrong, right? But the church doesn't know what to do with it because we haven't been taught how to test something and, and how to weigh it in. She goes on to say this, and this is really insightful. I thought this was kind of, like the best quote in the article. She says this, as denominational Christianity declines almost across the board, magnetic independent leaders have stepped into the void. There is, there's this idea that you can't trust anybody except these trusted individuals. Sid Brad Christensen, a sociologist at Evangelical Biola University. It's a symptom of our time. People don't trust institutions and people think that all the mainstream institutions are corrupt. Universities, science, government, the media, they're all searching for real sources for the truth, for of, uh, real sources of truth. Come on, right? Like, just, just, just think of this for a second, right? Organizational Christianity is falling apart, right? Tribalism and factions are opening up in, in greater ways than we've ever seen. And the pandemic has accelerated all this. But what's also happening, too, there is a deep mistrust of institutions. And again, I think there's reasons for it. Because institutions have acted and behaved in ways that have been absolutely partisan and absolutely disingenuous. Right? And because of that, there is a great longing to know what's true. But what's interesting is magnetic independent leaders, musicians, prophets, celebrity pastors, again, YouTube. If someone ever says to me, I saw something on YouTube, honestly, uh, again, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty easygoing guy, but it drives me crazy. Whenever the conversation starts off with, hey, I saw this video on YouTube, it's like, Oh, dear goodness. Okay, so what, what's going on, right? Everybody's got a YouTube channel, Twitter followers, Instagram. I'm an influencer. I'm a micro-influencer. I, I don't know if macro-influencer means you're like, like large. I, I don't know what it all means. But simply put is, the church is really struggling with knowing what is true, right? So when John says back in 1 John chapter 4, test, right? Test to see if what, is, what, what, what people are saying, what people are proclaiming is true, I feel like nobody wants to test anymore. We're so desperate for people to tell us what we want to believe that we are just accepting everything. 
And whether that spills over into politics, whether that spills over into social um, issues, the church looks absolutely stupid right now. And nobody's calling it out. Right? Nobody's calling it out. You know why we're not calling it out? Because we don't know what to do. Right? Remember I told you we spent a lot of time in verse 1? Now you see why, right? So let me show you something. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, God tells Moses to tell the people, here is a test to know if this is a false prophet. Look what Deuteronomy 18 says. But any prophet who falsely claims to speak in my name or speaks in the name of another God must die. Please hear me very clearly. I'm not telling you to kill anybody, all right? But you may wonder, how will we know whether or not the prophecy is from the Lord? Great question. If the prophet speaks in the Lord's name, but his prediction does not happen or come true, you will know that the Lord did not give that message. That prophet has spoken without my authority and need, and, and need not be feared. Did you know that in the Old Testament, as a prophet, if you were wrong once, one time, people, one time, if you are wrong once, you are a false prophet. Just let that sink in for a second. Just let that sink in. Like, honestly, hashtag Deuteronomy 18, 20, right? For all the political individuals, for all the social uh, justice individuals, for all the, all the, all the, all the, all the. If you speak in God's name, and, and maybe what's happening here is we just don't fear or revere God enough that we, are, we have the audacity to say, thus saith the Lord. I remember when I was a kid in my church, Pentecostal church, an individual would, set up, would stand up every Sunday, and in Pentecostal services, a word of prophecy was, was very common for our services. And, and this guy would stand up, and he would say something like, thus saith the Lord, and then he would go on and say something. And I used to always think to myself, did God really say? Because what I always found very fascinating is that every week it sounded like God said the exact same thing over and over through this guy. And I always felt like, is God not original? Or is it, or is, is like, you know, like a record player is stuck in a loop there? Like whenever somebody says, God told me, we have to always test, did God really tell you? So, I just want to let you know something. As a pastor, there have, been, there have been times in the past where I've been praying with somebody and I feel like God gave me a word for them. And I'll tell them that, but I always say it this way. I always frame it this way. I'm just going to share something with you, but I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate or true. I, I'm not sure if it's right, but I'm just going to share it with you anyways. And you can just discern whether it's from God or not. And the reason I offset it that way is because I don't want the individual to ever think that I have a direct conduit toward it from God. Right, And I never want to betray myself as thinking that I know God's thoughts. So I always say to them, you know, I feel like God's saying this to you. I feel like God, you know, is, is, at, is saying this, but I just want you to know that I'm not 100% sure this is correct, and I just want you to, you know, discern whether you think this is authentic or not. So what's interesting here is that John is saying to the church back then in 9018, test the spirits, right? Test them. And he's saying that to us today as Christ followers. You know, I was, I was talking to producer Brock this morning, and I just realized something that, you know, as we are in the lockdown and, and you, know, um, you know, the Ontario government has given us new restrictions and there's been back and forth on it. I just realized something. I don't ever want to be in charge. And whenever I say I don't want to be in charge, then, you, then I always have a bit of a graciousness for those who are in charge. I know that sounds weird, but honestly, I think to myself that, like, again, I'm as frustrated as you are in regards to what's going on in, in the fourth lockdown and, and, you know, outside, inside, police, no, I, I get it, okay? I get it. But I just realized I don't want to be in charge. I don't want to tell anybody what to do because I have no idea. I, I do want to say, hey, get your vaccinations. That's all, I, that's, that's all I know for sure right now. Get your vaccinations, right? That's it. That's it. That's all I got, right? So... What we have to say to ourselves is we must test the Spirit. And for any Christ follower who speaks on God's behalf politically, socially, morally, and they are wrong, right? And we have a great, wheel to, a great way of testing. First of all, if what you say didn't happen, if what you said didn't happen, you're false. And I'm never listening to you again. There's an individual at a very prominent church 
in America, church might be called Bethel, I don't know. He said back in January, something was going to happen, didn't happen. And he then came out and saying, oh, I was wrong. No, 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 you're not wrong, you're false. And I'm never listening to you again because of what you said one time, then I'm never listening to you again because you are a false prophet. Doesn't sound harsh? I know I'm going on, please forgive me, but I am, as a pastor, I am very frustrated because Christians are acting and behaving in ways that are bringing dishonor to God. And honestly, as a pastor, like that's the thing I fear the most, right? That's the thing I fear the most is, is I, I know my life isn't perfect and I know I'm not uh, in any way, shape or form the ideal Christian. So I always try to make sure that when I'm, I'm trying to speak for God or on God's behalf. I want to make sure that whatever I'm saying is as aligned as possible as I can know to Scripture, right? There's a great fear in me that I get it wrong, right? And so I just don't find that fear in the world today. Um, almost done on this first one here. There's an ancient document called the Didache. The Didache is a first century document, and in the Didache, what we have is rules for discernment, right? So in the first century, Right, as John is saying, there's lots of false prophets, people going to churches, people speaking of things, and, and John's going to show us one of the things in a second. But the Didache, the first century document, said, listen, here are regulations on how to deal with wandering apostles. Could you imagine this, for example? You're in Corinth or Galatia or Thessalonica or Antioch, and a person walks in saying, hey, I'm a prophet of God. And you're like, okay. And this is what you should do. As a matter of fact, you know, there's one of these rules in the Didache, that if a person comes to your village or your town and says, I'm a prophet of God, you're not allowed to give them any money. What? Because people were trying to fleece the church. So the Didache says, if someone comes to your town or village and claims to be a prophet of God, make them work for their food. <laughs> Is there a better way of weeding out people trying to make a quick buck? Like, 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 the, like the first century church, they weren't stupid. They saw people trying to abuse other Christians. So they put into place ways and behavior saying, okay, listen, we need to make sure that we are not listening to wrong people and we're not believing people. So the Didache is a fascinating document, first century document. And again, the church would use this to say, okay, before we start listening to your believing you or giving you anything, let's just make sure your life is aligned with the Bible, right? Again, something we think we need to go. Now, John here is going to give us in verse two or three the basis for a discernment. Look what he says here. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus came in a real body, that person has a spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming into the world and it is indeed is already here. Remember, Antichrist, anti-Christian. Now, John is saying, test the spirits, test whatever he's saying. But for him, the particular thing that's really bothering him is there's people coming in the church and they're saying, oh, by the way, Jesus wasn't a real person. He was a spirit being. He was this. And you're thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't happen today. Oh, it, it, it doesn't? Well, let me just give you some examples of, of how that's happening today, right? In cults and other religions, how we look at Jesus is part and parcel to it, right? So the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus was a spirit person just as God is spirit, right? By the way, this is taken from their, uh, their main websites. I don't want to make anything up for them, right? The Mormons are Latter-day Saints. They consider each person divine in origin, nature, and potential. The funny thing about Mormons is they, they call themselves Christians, but really they're not. Right, Because what at the very core of Mormon belief is, is that everybody is divine. Now, just to be clear, you are not divine, I am not divine. There's only one that is divine, that is God. But Mormons believe that we can ascend to divinity, which again, that's what they believe about Jesus, that he ascended to divinity like any other person could. Again, not right, right? Christian science, the spiritual Christ was infallible, Jesus as material manhood was not Christ. And again, I don't even know what that means. But again, when you unpack Christian science, which, by the way, is a gobbledygook of theology, you get that, right? Also, Islam. For Muslim, Jesus is neither God nor the Son of God. So Jesus isn't divine in that sense. However, 
There's other surahs in the Quran that say different things, but again, I'm not here to unpack uh, Islamic theology. But simply put is, we think to ourselves, oh, this is back in the first century, but even today, we have to make sure that we understand something about Jesus, that Jesus, whoever he is, came in the flesh. Now, why is this so important to John? Why is it so important to us today? So the in flesh, the incarnation, by the way, incarnation is Latin term for incarne, which simply means to put on flesh, right? The incarnation is connected to mission. Jesus' flesh validates God's love for fallen, broken world. You know, what was interesting for me growing up in the church is that I believed that the sole purpose of a Christ follower was to escape this world. Right? There was very much an escapism in the 1970s, yeah, I'm that old, in the early 1980s, where it was just like, we need to escape from this earth to heaven. No one ever told me that what we're supposed to do as Christ followers is bring heaven to earth. The values of the kingdom were meant to be lived out here and now, but in the flesh. So for the incarnation, is connected. If you don't believe Jesus comes in the flesh, then why would you try to feed the hungry? What do you care about the poor? Because it's all spiritual, right? So the incarnation, the putting on flesh that Jesus had is central to mission, but it's also connected to discipleship. We are called to be transformed in our flesh by means of placing our bodies in the disciplines of holiness, right? So remember back, doesn't it feel like forever ago, we did the whole series on, um, on, on um, the Pandemic Faith Survival Kit, right? Spiritual disciplines. So what we tried to do is, was I try to show you things that you can do in your daily lives that help create space for God. And really, what the spiritual disciplines are, is just space for God, right? Prayer, meditation, fasting, uh, generosity, these are all ways that we create space for God. The spiritual disciplines are a way for us to create space for God. But these are done in our flesh. But not only in that, though, it's also in Jesus as well, too. The writer of Hebrews tells us that this high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So not only are we meant to transform our flesh by the spiritual disciplines, transform our behavior in the flesh, but Jesus experienced what we experienced in the flesh as well. So John is saying to the early church, listen, if anybody comes to you and says, listen, Jesus was not, not in the flesh, what they're really discounting is the world, the material world that Jesus came into to redeem it and change it. Right? So for John and for us today, our flesh is important because it's part of our redemption. Now let's wrap up here. John, in verses four to six, he says this. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. So, Two spirits here, right? Again, John has been, has been alluding to this and talking about it. But now, look what I've emphasized here. How do we know if somebody is of Jesus? And how do we know if somebody is of the world? Well, the repetition is the word belong here. John says, if you belong to God, then you will think, act, behave, and believe as God would have you. If you belong to the world, you will act, live, think, and behave according to the world. And as Christ followers, there's always that tension, obviously. It's not a perfection. It's not, yes, one or the other. We wrestle with both of them. But that wrestling is what John really wants us to understand. See, what's interesting about these, three, these verses was, is John starts with the test, shows the true Christ, which is in the flesh, but ultimately brings us to his true north, which is belonging. See, ultimately, what John really wants us to know is this idea of what belongs. Um, The Heidelberg Catechism has this great phrase, and I love the fact that the Heidelberg Catechism, a catechism is just simply uh, doctrine or theology taught in a way to help people understand. But within their catechism, they have this idea of belonging. Look what they say. I belong, body and soul, in life and death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I kind of love that, right? Now, why is blogging so important? Well, what John understands, what we kind of forget, but I think we actually are starting to realize in this lockdown is this. Blogging is our primary human need. Beyond food and shelter, nothing promotes human flourishing like having a people and place of belonging. Research confirms that income level, marriage and children, and perceived security all pale in comparison to belonging and promoting sustained happiness. We long to belong. loneliness, isolation, stuff we're all feeling. We're going to talk about this at the end here, but this is all stuff we're feeling. Our sense of belonging is absolutely being tested right now, right? We are absolutely being stretched to extremes that no, none of us thought of a year and a half ago, right? But what John is saying is, ultimately, who you belong to will, will show the truth of what you believe and how you behave. Like that's his true north. That is his, 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 his compass point of Jesus. That's how he understands this. Now, look at where we've been so far. And I just show you an example here, right? John keeps using language here. Children, children, brothers and sisters, family, right? Like, like what is John trying to emphasize for us? Who do you belong to? You belong to God. And if you belong to God, you belong to the family of God. Right? That's ultimately what John is trying to understand, right? So what's happening here is he is giving us this, this mode of trans of transformation. Remember, it always comes back to what we're being transformed in. So we have to test the spirits. This is we are what we believe. By the way, I was just thinking about that phrase, we are what we believe. Do you know what therapy and counseling is? Therapy and counseling is a counselor or professional talking to an individual to find out what false beliefs they have about themselves or about reality that they are basing their lives upon and, and, and examining it and showing it to the person and then saying, by the way, you have been, uh, you have been uh, living this lie out, right? This thing in your past, this thing in your present is so affecting you that you have actually altered your life because of it, right? So what John is saying is we are what we believe, so make sure we believe what is true. The basis centers around the authentic, the authentic Jesus. We don't have a, a savior. We don't have a God that is unaware of what we've gone through. He has gone through it in his flesh as well. And of course, the evidence. Nothing will separate us from God, right? Belonging is this idea of separating us from God. So let me close um, with this. This is the phrase that kind of jumped out at me. Who do you belong to? And what makes you question this? That's really what John is asking of us. Like, like, like who do you belong to? And again, that's such a weird statement because we don't actually really think about that, right? Whether we're married, whether we uh, have a boyfriend, girlfriend, whether we have friends or family, whatever it looks like, right? But John is actually transcending the material way of looking at that. He's saying, listen, our sense of belonging is actually a spiritual, uh, a, a spiritual assertion. So what I realized here was John was asking us, is, who do you belong to? But the other part, though, the testing is, what makes you question this? So if I said to you, do you belong to God? You could say yes. But throughout your life, what makes you question whether you actually truly belong to God? And I would say the answer is sin. Right? Sin is what makes you question whether you belong to God. And then John would say, do you not remember the first chapter, if we confess our sins? The psalmist says this, and I love it. Psalm 119, 94, and the first part says this. I am yours, rescue me. I love that. I belong to you, now help me, God. Right? That's actually my battle cry, right? Lord, I belong to you, rescue me. Rescue me from myself. Rescue me from my wrong thinking. Rescue me from my wrong beliefs. Rescue me from my sin. Rescue me from myself. And not rescue me that takes me from this world, but instead, in this world, you transform me. You change me. You challenge me. You conform me, not to my image, but to the image of Jesus. Right? I am yours. Rescue me. John is going to constantly make sure that we are assessing, reassessing who we are and what we are. And you know what I, I realize is false beliefs 
they are so subtle. They just, they just happen in ways we can't even uh, acknowledge. And John is always saying, make sure you don't accept the world's values. Make sure you don't accept the world's narratives. Make sure you don't accept false prophets. Test. Test everything. And, and again, what's the test? Jesus in his flesh. Right? That's the test for, for John. Whatever we do, whatever we say, we look to Jesus and how he lived amongst us, taught us, died for us, but also his resurrection as well too, all in the flesh. I am yours, rescue me. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, our sense of belonging, our sense of, 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 of what we adhere ourselves to is always being tested. And Lord, I recognize that this new lockdown, this new reality that we're all living in is it's just testing us further. And God, for those who just feel burnt out, worn out, tired, stressed, anxious, and whatever other words we want to put in there, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that even right now you would confirm in all our hearts, all our minds, in our spirits, that we belong to you. I think of Romans 8 where Paul makes kind of a ridiculous statement. He says, what can separate us from the love of God? Right? What can separate us from the love of God? And he goes on to list the most ridiculous things. And, 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 and at the end of it, he says, and anything else in all creation. In other words, if anything else in this I missed. Lord, we belong to you. Forgive us for the times we question that. Forgive us for the times that our sin defines who you are. Forgive us when our wrong beliefs define who you are. Forgive us when the world defines who you are. God, I thank you that we have your word, the Bible. And that we get to see for ourselves, we get to read for ourselves who you are. And God, maybe right now as people are hearing my voice or seeing this, that they realize as well too that they need to kind of start reading the Bible, not reading about the Bible or listening to other people talk about the Bible, but they just need to read the Bible themselves. Because Holy Spirit, you take that and you reveal the true God to us. And I just pray, God, that that would be our heart's desire. Thank you, Jesus, that you are merciful and gracious to us time and 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 time again. And a few more times in there as well. You love us. You forgive us. You pick us up when we fall. And by your Holy Spirit, you continue to transform us. And we continue to point ourselves to you, Jesus, our true north. Thank you, Lord, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Stick with us. I'm going to answer any questions that have come in, and I've got a couple of announcements I just want to share with you. And again, something I think is really important. So please stick with us after the song. Hey, welcome back. So I've got a question here I just want to answer. So the question is this. Just to confirm, <clears throat> sorry, I need some water for my Batman glass. Okay. <clears throat> Just to confirm, on the rules of discernment slide, does a behavior belief have to fit all four criteria, or is it more consider how e it fits each criteria, and then from those answers, discern maybe if it's good or not? Yeah, I think, like, ideally, if it fits all four, the best, right? So is it in the Bible? Does it appear in more than one place in the Bible? Um, does it find itself in Jesus, and does it find itself in the Jewish context? Uh, ideally, it should fit all four. As a matter of fact, I, I was just, I'm just thinking uh, that question. It's really well worded, by the way. But it's like, huh, what theology do I have that I can't find in Jesus? What theology do I have that doesn't fit in the Jewish context? So maybe all four, right? I think whatever we believe or behave should at least hit all three, three out of four. But ideally, it should be four out of four. And I know you're like, well, like, how do I find four, four out of four? Well, that's where we look at the harmony of Scripture and the Bible. I think that's really important. So a, a great question. And again, it's just my tools. Like, I, like there are so many lists of, of how to discern, discern and test. Those are just four simple ones, I think, that are really important, right? Is it in the Bible? Is it in more than one place in the Bible? Um, not the next series, but the series after that. Um, it's a series I'm calling Confronting Christianity. Uh, and it's basically a series looking at uh, some of the misbeliefs that the world has of Christians, and one of those is going to be how Christians have looked at the end times and how unbiblical a lot of what we say about the end times is, but 
you'll have to wait till we get to that from there. Yeah, that I, I do plan a little bit ahead. Anyways, so what's interesting is that, you know, oftentimes we, we make assertions about what's going on in the world based upon one passage of Scripture. And again, that multiple part, I think, is really important. The Jewish one, honestly, I don't know. I just I just wish more people would talk about that that context of it. So yeah, so I think I think it you know ideally all four, but it, it again it should at least hit three out of the four, if not all four. Um, just quick reminder again, just not even anything else, but just saying thank you, thank you for those of you who continue to support UCC in this time. We still have financial obligations. We're still paying rent at the Princess Twin Cinemas, but the good news is as well too is that we are. Um, on a weekly basis, I'm giving out gift cards and, and helping people. And so um, thank you for your continued uh, support, your faithful act of worship, which is your, you know giving to the church. Um, it just helps us to be able to help the community and, and to keep our financial obligations going. Um, I just want to share something with you. So my family received some really tragic news this week. Uh, and... Um, Without going into much detail, it's just a re- it just it just hit, it's hit us really hard in regards to you know what people are going through. And this morning, as I was kind of meditating, reflecting, um, I felt like God dropped a passage of scripture in my in my heart. <laughs> and again, if it means something to you or it doesn't mean anything to you, but it's the Bible, so uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna apologize too much for it. I just want to share it with you, and I just want to kind of leave you something. Galatians chapter six, verse nine and ten says this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. And just at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we do not give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Here is my challenge to all of you, because I am feeling, I personally am feeling stressed. I am personally feeling worn out. I am personally feeling fatigued. Just so you know, I didn't get into ministry to talk to a camera. You know, um... It is frustrating for me as a pastor not to be able to care for all of you, not to be able to engage with all of you as we do on a Sunday morning. And I'm just realizing that I think that there is a heightened sense of anxiety, a heightened sense of loneliness, a heightened sense of all that. So here's what I want to do. In this entire week on our social media, on our Facebook and Instagram, follow us on both of those if you don't already. Here's what I want everyone to do this week. I want us all to reach out to people this week. Text, email, better yet, Zoom. If you don't have Zoom, I will set you up. Don't worry, we have a Zoom account for the church. But I think it's important for us to just check in on everybody to see how everyone's doing. I, I'm, I just feel as if people are really just burnt out. And we're frustrated, we're alone. And I think we are all getting tired. We're all tired of doing what is good. So in the comment section right now uh, of our online church, I want you, if you are feeling this as well too, just to say to, hey, hey, pastor, I will reach out to some people this week. This entire week is going to be a mental health week, just a reminders for us, because I think that we are doing that. Email people, reach out, email me if you feel like you want to, but just realize that I think that it's just, this has gone on a lot longer than we have thought it was going to. And it doesn't seem like it's, it's letting up anytime soon. It feels like hope is diminishing. It feels like we are all tired of what, doing what is good. So here's my challenge to all of you. I want you to reach out to people this week, whether you've talked to them recently or haven't heard from them. There's a couple people that popped to mind that I haven't heard from in a couple of weeks. Email text, call everyone, um, FaceTime them if you can, whatever you can do. But let's just check in on everyone this week. Can we do that? That's my challenge to you. I am feeling it. The tragic news that my family received this week of, of an individual who who just who just did something that is irreversible. It's just a reality check that I think that we are assuming that everyone's doing okay, but I don't think that we all are. And I, like I said, what Paul saying Galatians here, I think we have just gotten tired of, 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 of supporting, caring for one another. And so I really want everyone this week to just to do that. Just check in. You know, you can send an email off to me and I hear, just so you know, Monday, I'm going to go through my list of people and I'm going to email the heck out of everyone. So you just don't be surprised if you don't get my email. If I don't have your email, 
please forgive me if I haven't sent you the email, but I'm just going to use this week on our UCC social media just to remind us, just to check in with each other, because I think that we're feeling it in a way that we haven't. There's no end in sight, and we're just feeling really tired. And I feel like we're all feeling very, very alone, and that's that is just heart-wrenching to me. And I don't want to see anybody hurt themselves. I don't want anybody else to feel unsupported. Uh, and so as your pastor, as a pastor of UCC, as your, as your shepherd, whatever metaphor you want to put, do this, okay? Don't just watch this and say, yeah, that's a good idea. Do this. I'm going to remind you on Facebook uh, every week, on Instagram. Um, we are going to do this. We're going to remind everyone. I'm going to email people as well, too, to check in. Let's just take care of each other. Uh, guys, I don't know when this is going to be over. I don't know when we're going to gather again. I don't. We had some plans, but now those plans are going to have to, we're just going to have to see. We're going to continue to do our online thing, but let's just each other take care of each other. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. Let us not get weary, tired, bored. Let us not give up. God has not abandoned us. He has not forgotten us. He has not forsaken us. So right now, just just do that, okay? Um, just just please check in with each other. Uh, come on, comment right now. I'm, I'm I'm looking at it right now. Just 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 comment right now. Say you're gonna look after each other. Look, you're gonna look after it. Um, I think it's so important. I think that's something that we just need to. Remember to do. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you walk with us. You have not abandoned us. You have not forsaken us. You have not forgotten us. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you encourage us, that you would remind us to take care of each other. There are people in our church who are hurting, who are feeling alone. We're feeling isolated, and that is not what you want. God, I pray that we would not grow tired of, of taking care of one another. Holy Spirit, I just pray you'd remind us, place in, place in our hearts right now, Lord, names and faces of people that we need to reach out to. Lord, I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that the only thing I can control is to reach out to people to make sure they're okay. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just remind us of that this week. I just pray there'd be an outpouring of love within our community and those who are peripheral to our community, Lord God, that we would take care of each other, remind each other, Lord. Thank you that you have not abandoned us, forgotten us, or forsaken us. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Don't forget... I'm counting on you to take care of each other, take care of me, take care of all of us so that we can be supported in this, uh, in this, in this continuing reality. Thanks so much for joining us. We will see you guys next week. Take care. Blessings.